So let's get started. And the first talk uh, will be by Scott Morrison from the uh, Australian National University. And he will tell us about um, higher dimensional algebras. Great. Thanks very much, Dietmar. Yeah, it's uh, always a great pleasure to be back here at NCGOA. I think actually that the NCGOA was there one in 2002 or 2003, something like that. Was, I think that was my, the very first conference I ever went to. This is the was, one, so. was that the first one? Or, yeah. uh, okay, okay, I was there at the beginning maybe uh, as a little tiny student. Um, yeah, okay. So this talk today uh, is the, the first of a two-part talk. Uh, Kevin Walker uh, is going to tell you all the real punchlines of this talk, I think, on, uh, on Sunday is his talk. Uh, and I will try and uh, show you some of the, the definitions and motivations at the beginning of, of this project. So, yeah, the, the idea... Do you want to change the light a little bit? Ah, yeah. Cool. Will that put everyone to sleep? Or is that okay? It's first thing in the morning. It's only me who's asleep. I just came from Israel. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, so the idea of this talk is to uh, explain some ideas about higher dimensional algebras. That is, uh, I think probably uh, most people have seen the idea of an algebra internal to a tensor category. Uh, that's just an, an algebra object in a, in a category. And the idea here is to work out what the corresponding good notions are uh, in, in higher categories, in three categories and, and so on. Uh, okay, so the, um, the, the point of doing this is not just because algebras are fun, but to understand modules for higher categories. And the reason for doing that is because the modules for higher categories are a, are a good mathematical formulation of the idea of, uh, of domain walls between topological phases. So I think this is stuff that hopefully um, will be interesting and even useful uh, to physicists, uh, but this talk uh, is going to concentrate on the, on the, the mathematical setting, and I think Kevin's talk will explain uh, some of the ideas of, of how it might be useful in physics, um, particularly uh, talking about uh, symmetry and rich phases. Okay. Uh, okay. Now, uh, maybe something to apologize about for the, the mathematicians. Uh, we're not attempting to do things uh, in the greatest generality possible, although you might fear that, given that I'm talking about higher categories already. And so we will very happily uh, assume that things are pivotal, that is, that things have all sorts of sort of rotational symmetry, uh, that things are semi-simple, indeed, that all our categories are unitary. Positive definite inner products, anyway, anyway they're helpful uh, in, in what we do here. Uh, some of this might work in more generality, some of it probably won't, uh, but today there's that. Uh, maybe um, one thing I should say before I get too far, uh, these notes are, are already online. Uh, if you want to uh, uh, read them either now during the talk or later, uh, tqft.net slash talks should have the PDF. Uh, of all of this. Okay, so before we try and go into the, the general nonsense of what uh, algebras in, in higher dimensions are, let's understand some examples in low dimensions and see why we're so happy about, about these examples and see what it is that we're trying to generalize. So first of all, let's just think about uh, the, the easiest possible case. An algebra, in the entirely conventional sense, just some vector space with a multiplication uh, acting on a vector space. And that, so all of that is is some algebra homomorphism from your algebra A into the algebra N of V, where V is your vector space. But now, when everything is semi-simple enough, uh, something marvelous happens. So let's, let's assume the algebra is semi-simple, say, over the complex numbers, and V is some, uh, some indecomposable representation. What you can do is... is find some data inside of A, that is some item coded inside of A, so that the representation was really just A cut down by that projection, okay? So we've, we've, what we've done is we've, we've taken this thing that the algebra is acting on, we've, we, we've, we've discovered some data internal to A, and then we've said that actually really that module we had was, was built out of that, that internal data in, in the algebra A. Okay. Uh, going up a dimension, Let's think now about a tensor category acting on a one category. So this is just the usual notion of a, of a module category. Uh, and so again, that's, that's almost the same data, just one category level higher. Now we just have some, some monoidal functor from our tensor category C into the monoidal category of endo functors from M to itself, 
And then there's a next layer of structure of the natural transformations between those n-depth functors. Okay, that uh, is certainly a lot more data than just the algebra map from A to N to V. Um, and uh, you might, well, and it, it's starting to feel a little complicated, but we have this amazing fact, which uh, is due to Ostrich, uh, which says again, as, as, uh, with a few extra assumptions, so let's say that C is a fusion category, and uh, again, let's take our, our module category to be indecomposable. In Ostrich's theorem guarantees that we can find some algebra internal to C, so that's just some object A, uh, an, an object in the tensor category C, along with some multiplication map, uh, so that's just some, some morphism in the category from A tensor A to A, satisfying an associativity law, and, and also some, some equations which I didn't write down here uh, about special Frobeniusness, uh, maybe a few others as well. And then the conclusion of Ostrich's theorem is that you can get this algebra, and then the module category that you that you were looking at at the beginning was just the category of module objects for that algebra. Okay, so here uh, mod A, uh, sort of internal to C, just means the collection of all objects internal to C equipped with uh, uh, an action of A, again, as a, as a morphism in, in C. And that forms a little category. It's pretty obvious that this thing, uh, this gadget is acted on by C, if you've got a right A module object, you can always just tensor it with an arbitrary other object of the category on the, on the left, and that's, in, that's still a right A module object. So this gadget is a C module category, and the statement is that, that our original M uh, was equivalent as a module category to that one. And so again, we did exactly the same thing. We had our, our category acting on something, and we, we discovered some internal data uh, inside the category that we covered everything about the, uh, the module. Oh, well, no, 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 no. I mean, so the, the this algebra A was inside that fusion category. I mean, it somehow... It's not an algebra. No, it's not a, this isn't an honest algebra. This is a, an algebra, yeah, internal to the fusion category. Yeah. Okay, and maybe I should say already, actually, that, of course, there's a... Um, there's really a correspondence going on here. It's not just that... Um, uh, and maybe I sort of implicitly said this, but obviously you can you just here you were saying that given a module you can realize it as an algebra. But of course, if you've got an algebra, you can always do this construction here and get a module category. And the, the point of Ostrich's theorem is that that's a bijection uh, and, and in an appropriate categorical sense as well. Okay, so let's go on to some some higher dimensional examples. What if we had some uh, some three category maybe describing some three dimensional topological phase, and we had a a two category that it's meant to act on, so some, some domain wall, uh, and you might try and describe that action uh, in, in much the same way as some, as some three functor now from, uh, from V into the, the endo functors of C, so, so that's saying that, uh, uh, well, over here I've, I've written out the pieces of the three category V, and here are the pieces of the three category endomorphisms of C, so the C at the bottom level, and there's functors from C to C, and then appropriate layers at the top. You don't need to understand at all what those are if you, if you don't want to. It won't really come into the rest of the talk. Uh, but I just want to say what happens in the special case where the three category that's acting is a braided category. So here the idea is you can think of any braided category as a three category just by saying, well, there's a, there's a, there's a, a single zero morphism called I usually call it turtle, because it's turtles all the way down. Uh, and then a single one morphism that's uh, also called turtle. And then what you usually think of as the objects of the braided category sitting here as the two morphisms. And what you usually think of as the morphisms of a braided category sitting here at the, at the three morphisms. So if you were doing that, if you were trying to specialize this picture to a braided category acting on a tensor category, then there's nothing at these levels. So over here, you don't see anything interesting. Uh, the, you, the, 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 unique ob the unique one morphism here has to be sent to the identity uh, functor from C to C. And then if you go and unravel the definition of what a pseudo-natural transformation of the identity functor is, you see that that's just definitionally the same as the object of the Drinfeld center of your tensor category C. So this idea here of a three category acting on a two category exactly says that if you've got a braided category and you want it to act on a tensor category, you have to give a braided functor from V into the Drinfeld center of C. And that's something that uh, hopefully uh, 
uh, hopefully some people have seen, but again, it's not necessary to have thought much about this example uh, to understand the rest of the talk. Okay, so far on this slide I haven't done anything. I've just sort of unwrapped some definitions about what it is for a braided category to act on a tensor category. The, the question which I want to have you think about and we'll start to try and answer is what do you do to, to make this example look like the ones on the previous page? Okay, what is the, in, the data internal to V which, uh, which, which carries this, which, which tells you about this action on some other category? Okay, what's the thing corresponding to the item potent or the algebra inside V that, uh, that classifies such a module? Okay. Any questions on, on that? Okay, let's try, uh, okay, so what we, this is sort of the, the advertisement page where I uh, uh, state a few of the results or state a few of the things that we're aiming for. So the idea is we're going to start with some arbitrary, uh, some arbitrary n category uh, C, and we're going to define another n category called its completion, or maybe its algebra completion to specify what sort of completion uh, we have in mind. Now, in low dimensional cases, this is going to specialize to, to fairly familiar things. So uh, if n equals 1, we're just looking at a, at, a, at a plain old 1 category, this is just going to recover the item potent completion. That is, the, the new things we add in the algebra completion will just be item potents. Okay? And that matches the example we saw a few slides ago when we just had a, uh, an algebra acting on a vector space. You could realize that via an item potent inside the... Uh, inside the algebra. Similarly, uh, when C is a tensor category, uh, this, this completion that we're going to define is we're going to recover the two category of algebras in C, well, or maybe slightly more precisely, uh, the Frobenius algebras in C, uh, and then that's going to be a whole two category, so the zero morphisms will be the Frobenius algebras, the one morphism will be the bimodules, and the two morphisms will be the intertwinings between bimodules. And so again, this is a a, uh, a familiar thing uh, for, for many people, the idea that when you're studying a tensor category, you really should go away and study the algebras in that tensor category, and our completion uh, is giving you that. But then, for all other n, it gives you, this definition is going to give you something, and our claim is that by analogy with the, the interestingness of these things, uh, C bar is, is interesting in other dimensions as well. Okay, the, the next bullet point is, is sort of a... Uh, in part just meant to be a, a reassuring statement that we haven't run off the rails and done something too silly. Uh, so first of all, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a functor, I've called it iota, from the original category into its completion. So here, um, I mean, you can always just take an object of the original category, of the original one category C, and look at that object, comma, the identity item potent on it, and that gives you an object of the item potent completion. And... Um, Similarly, uh, if you've got a tensor category C, you've got a functor into the algebras in C. Uh, just uh, if you give me some object, uh, some object V uh, in a tensor category, then uh, VV dual is an algebra, okay, in a, in a very natural way, where the multiplication uh, is, this di is this diagram here. Okay, where we're using the, the uh, the duality between the duality pairing between V and VJ. And it's pretty easy to check that that is an associative multiplication. And this is the map uh, that embeds the, the original category into the, the category of algebras. Okay. So, okay, so we've got that in general. You can embed the original category into the, uh, into the completion. And indeed, uh, that iota induces a Morita equivalence. Uh, so maybe I'll say a little bit more about what we even mean by Morita equivalence in, in higher dimensions. Uh, but for now, uh, the, the point is just that uh, Morita equivalence uh, does what you would like it to do. That is, it says that the, the modules for C are exactly the same as the, the modules for C bar. Okay. Uh, moreover, uh, this, this inclusion of, uh, of the original category into its completion is is terminal amongst such pairs. So that's some universal property telling you that, uh, uh, that uh, this is the best way to, uh, to stick C into, uh, into something bigger 
uh, such that the, the bigger thing is still mood equivalent to, uh, to what you started with. And from these facts and a, and a little bit more work, you can in fact deduce the, this nice fact that two n categories, C and D, are mood equivalent. Exactly if their completions are, are uh, a functorially equivalent. Okay, so it uh, it uh, it gives us a nice way to think about about mood equivalences between 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 higher categories. Okay, but then the punchline, which I'm not going to say anything more about beyond this bullet point today, uh, is that as long as you have some extra hypotheses about semi-simplicity or, or non-degeneracy of inner products, uh, there's really an equivalence between uh, this completion and the and the module categories. Uh, for the original C. Uh, and in particular here, the, the, you should think of the inverse of this equivalence as giving you a generalization of Ostrich's theorem. It tells you every time you have some, some representation, some, some boundary for the, the n category C, uh, you can go back and pick out some, some higher dimensional algebra in C, that is some, some <coughs> zero morphism of C bar, uh, so that the module you had was just sort of built out of that algebra. It's just the, the modules for that algebra. Questions? So mentioned you're using as a tool for the N and the N category. Yeah, yeah, because they, they, they describe, I mean, you, and you should think that they're describing um, that an N category is about string diagrams in N dimensions or about topological phases in, in N dimensions. Yeah, so, so always here you should think that we've got some N dimensional bulk and an N minus one dimensional boundary that is the, the, the module that we're acting on. Mike? So this is a just a comment on completion. Uh, I've mentioned it to you, so this is really for the audience. So I think that completion has to do with uh, gap, gapless versus gap, uh, because that seems to be the way it works out in computer science theory in uh, two categories. Uh, and I just, I just wonder whether you or anyone in the audience agrees with this or disagrees. Yeah, I'm not sure what. Yeah, I'm not sure what you have in mind. Um, well, in, uh, in string science theory, you can represent ground state phases as loop gases, uh, where the loops don't have any like trivalent vertices. And then, if you kind of compress strings together and take uh, the decomposition in terms of tensor product representations, yeah. and you add the eigenpotency, you add the other uh, irreducible representation, then you get uh, Just my experience with that one example suggests that completion from a physical point of view is the way they get uh, the gap to Okay, yeah. I mean, I think Kevin will, will talk more about something near to this in, in his talk, maybe when he's going to talk about sort of how to get state sum models for, for, for TFT, for higher dimension, for arbitrary dimension TFTs out of this picture. Which, I, which is perhaps just a different language for saying uh, the same thing that state sum model is effectively a gap to model. Yeah. Um, so totally yeah. How weak are your end Oh yeah. So they're um, they're completely weak. Uh, yeah. Um, the this talk is sort of going to try and stay model agnostic for the <laughs> the end categories. Um, so certainly, uh, when Kevin and I think about this, we always think in terms of of disk-like end categories, which is our own particular favorite flavor of higher categories, um, where everything is is as weak as you could possibly want. Um, but uh, pivotality is baked in right from the beginning. That is, objects are, are always have duals, and those and those duals sort of behave very nicely in the same way that in n equals two uh, sort of pivotal categories allow arbitrary rotations of diagrams. Um, what does weak mean? Uh, oh, so weak is is just um, like, uh, whether you uh, expect at, whether you expect um, equations between. Uh, lower dimensional morphisms, that is, things that aren't at the top dimension, to hold on the nose, or only up to some isomorphism, which is some higher thing. And you've always got some amount of choice when doing, when doing higher categories. Uh, it's usually an awful pain to work with everything as weak as possible. Uh, and so people try and give semi-strict definitions, where you've, where you've asked for some things to be strict, 
but hopefully they then prove a theorem that says, ah, but a fully, a, an arbitrary weak thing is equivalent to one of these ones that's been partially strictified. Uh, yeah, we won't, we won't have to deal with those issues in here. But yeah, the, the, where we certainly intend that this is, this is all in, in the, in the, as weak as necessary situation. Okay. Okay, so before I give you the definition of this algebra completion, I'm going to have to go on a little detour uh, through talking about um, stratifications and string diagrams. Because this definition, although it's a definition of algebras, is going to look very topological uh, and not very algebraic at all. Okay, so what do I want to mean by a, a stratification? So let's say we've got some n-manifold w, and what follows that n-manifold is nearly always going to be an n-dimensional ball. But, uh, I guess, yep. <coughs> So it's, a, it's this filtration of W, so there's W0, which is everything, W1 sitting inside of that, all the way down to, to Wn. And what we're asking is that the, the successive differences of these things, so Wk minus Wk plus 1, is a co-dimension K submanifold of W. So that is, uh, W0 is everything, but once you, once you cut out W1, you see that it's a co-dimension 0 submanifold of, of the, the whole thing. And then when you look at W1, well, it's not necessarily itself a manifold, but once you cut out W2, it's some co-dimension one manifold of the, of the whole thing. Uh, is everyone happy with that? Do I, should I draw the picture? Oh, draw the picture. Okay, sorry. I should have had a picture here. Um, oops. So here's a W, uh, and then maybe uh, that thing with a vertex in it could be my W1, and of course that's not a manifold because it's got a non-manifold point there, but just that point by itself is my W2. Okay, so W2 is just a co-dimension 2 sub-manifold, that is a zero manifold, i.e. just a point, but if you look at W1 and you, and you cut out W2, it becomes the union of these open intervals uh, here, here, and here. Okay, and similarly, if I look at the whole thing, which is my W0, and I cut out all of W1, it becomes the union of those three disks. Okay. Okay, so we then give a, a, a definition of a, a string diagram stratification. So these are going to be stratifications which have a particularly nice local model. And the point of this definition is that we're going to want to talk about string diagrams, that is, sort of things that look like graphs or soap bubbles or something, uh, that represent morphisms in our category. But we want to make sure that the skeleton that those, those string diagrams live on is, is nice in various ways. So there, there are two different definitions of a string diagram stratification on this page. Uh, there's this first one, uh, which gives a, a local description of it. So what we're saying here is that every point in, the, in one of the, the, the co-dimension K strata has a neighborhood uh, in, the, in the whole manifold W, which looks like its neighborhood in the WK crossed with something, so that cross is like the, the normal bundle of that point, sort of pointing off, uh, in the direction uh, orthogonal to the strata that point lives in. And that little, that little normal disk around the point should look like a cone over some string diagram stratification of the sort of normal circle bundle. Okay, now this might seem like a, it, we're running in circles here. I defined a string diagram stratification in terms of a string diagram stratification, but of course it's, it's recursive and the dimension is decreasing, okay? So here, uh, the point is that uh, these, these little normal spheres around points, these n minus k minus 1 spheres, are, well, at, at worst, they're n minus 1 spheres, which are lower dimensional manifolds than the, uh, than the n manifold we're currently talking about as string diagram stratification. So it really is a, a reasonable definition. Okay, now ignore the definition and look at the examples. Uh, so here's a string diagram stratification of a 1 manifold. There's just no condition at all. In there, it's just a stratification of the one manifold, so that, so that is that W1 just consists of finitely many points in the interior of the manifold. Here's a string diagram stratification uh, in n equals 2, and again, there's, there's almost no condition here. Um, the, uh, is there any condition here at all? Yeah, maybe there's just no condition still in n equals 2 to be a string diagram stratification. Uh, but then in, in n equals 3, I've drawn a sort of typical example. So here, uh, what, all, that I, all that I'm saying is that 
the only sorts of uh, points you can see in co-dimension three, that is sort of the, 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 the points, the, the, the zero dimensional points of, of the stratification, are things that you get by drawing some, basically some nice graph on the boundary of a sphere and taking the cone, uh, the cone over that. So it's, uh, uh, it's some condition about the, the, the points in the, in the higher co-dimension pieces of, this, of the strata, that their neighborhoods always look kind of cone-like. And then there's a, there's a different definition here uh, below that you could um, maybe, that you would maybe prefer if you were more of a computer scientist. It's sort of an inductive definition of, of how to build uh, string diagram stratifications. So it says that you are a string diagram stratification exactly if you're either just the zero ball with its unique stratification or you are some string diagram stratification a dimension down crossed with an interval or you are some string diagram stratification of a sphere one dimension down and then you've taken the cone over that. So given a stratification there's a sort of obvious sense you can take the cone over a stratification and get a new stratified manifold is a stratified circle. Okay. There's, there's, a, there's a cone over it, which, which has most of its strata are in bijection with the strata of the, the original thing one dimension down, and there's one new there's one new stratum, the, the point at the center of the cone. Okay, and then you can glue together disjoint union two different string diagram stratifications, and you can take a string diagram stratification of some manifold and paste it up to itself to to get things on more interesting manifolds. And the claim is that these are these are just talking about the same thing. And somewhat curiously, uh, this definition is, is ancient. Uh, I can't even count how many decades ago that is. Um, but uh, Siebenman in 72 basically wrote down this definition for, for, for rather different reasons. Um, okay. Very close to Whitney Stratified space. Yeah. Four years old. But, yeah, okay. Okay. Um, okay. All that you really need to take from this slide is there's some nice condition about the about the neighborhoods of points looking like cones on, on the spheres near them. Okay. Now, this this page is just a slight variation on the previous page, but it's it's got some important ideas that we need to get our head around because we'll use this a lot later. So we we're now going to define a thing called a full stratification. And you should think that this is a stratification which fills out the topology of the manifold that it's that it's sitting in. So uh, one way of saying it is that uh, every component, so if you look at the, the, the k-dimensional stuff after you've chopped out, sorry, the, the, the co-dimension k stuff after you've chopped out the other stuff, we want each component to just be a ball. And moreover, uh, if one of those balls meets the boundary, it's only allowed to meet the boundary once. That is, it's allowed to meet the boundary in a single dimension, in a single ball one dimension lower. So let's look at this example here. So uh, what are the strata? Well, I guess in total there are, um, how many? Uh, uh, there's four co-dimension zero strata. There's five co-dimension one strata and two co-dimension two strata. Notice that each of the co-dimension zero strata meets the boundary in exactly one interval. The co-dimension one strata are either entirely in the interior or meet the boundary in a single interval. Uh, in a single point, rather, just up there, okay? And so this thing is a full stratification. Every component's a disk, and disks that meet the boundary only do so once. This guy here is not a full stratification because, well, it, it fails it several times over. This co-dimension zero strata in the middle meets the boundary in two separate disks, okay? So that's not allowed. It doesn't, uh, the stratification doesn't completely fill out the topology of the, of the disk that it's living in. And you can give an inductive definition of this condition as well, and it's in fact exactly the same inductive definition uh, as for a string diagram stratification, just you're not allowed to take identities over, over things. You're not allowed to cross things with, uh, cross things with an interval. Okay. Um, well, now we better connect all this stuff back to, to n categories for a moment. So uh, if C is some n category, again, uh, assuming some amount of, of pivotality, we've got nice duals, a, uh, a C string diagram 
just means that you've got some string diagram stratified ball, and each one of these, each one of the strata, uh, is labeled by uh, some uh, some k morphism for an appropriate k for looking at a, a codimension k um, piece of the stratification. Uh, so here, uh, if we had some two category and we had this diagram here, then uh, uh, alpha and beta and gamma would be uh, Oh, alpha, I didn't write a gamma. Yeah, alpha and beta uh, would be uh, zero morphisms of the category, labeling, labeling the codimension zero strata of the stratification. Uh, X and Y and Z here would be one morphisms in the category, uh, labeling the codimension one strata. And in particular here, X should be, to work out what sort of morphism you put on a uh, I guess the normal sphere. Uh, to x, and so this x here should be some one morphism from alpha to beta because those are the regions on either side. And similarly, the, then the codimension uh, two strata here should be labeled by two morphisms from the category. And again, this f here to work out what sort of morphism it is, you look at the um, the, this, the little linking sphere around it, and you see that this should be some morphism. Uh, well, you could do it many ways. You might think it's some morphism from y to x tensor z, or maybe it's from z to x tensor y. But all of those things are the same because we're assuming our categories are pivotal and there's a natural identification between the different ways of chopping up that little linking sphere into, a, into, a, into an incoming source and an outgoing target. So we don't really need to, because of pivotality, we don't need to worry about exactly how we did that. Okay. So all that I'm going to say in this talk about n categories is that any reasonable definition of n categories should let you take a C-string diagram and say what you mean by it. That is, uh, let you interpret some arbitrary, uh, some arbitrary C string diagram as itself some morphism in C, okay? Just by, by uh, uh, composing the morphisms in the directions indicated by the, by the string diagram. And indeed, uh, a, um, uh, a really minimal definition of an N category, which I think we're going to end up uh, giving in the paper about these higher dimensional algebras, uh, is, is, is extremely short and really just axiomatizes the properties of this evaluation map. It's the, you just say an n category is some collection of sets which tell you how to label the different the different codimension k strata, and then some rule that takes a string diagram and turns it back into one of those elements of the labeling set. Just turns a string, uh, an arbitrary string diagram, back into a morphism, and you can you can give a really slick definition of n categories. So it's, uh, well, the yeah, yeah, sorry, this, this absolutely should have, um, yeah, it should have had arrows everywhere, yep. yep. So that's exactly a high principle what I did Yeah, 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 yep, no, I, I should, uh, yeah, I, lots of, the, the, the whole, I mean, yeah, lo, lots of this stuff, the disc-like uh, definitions of n categories and, uh, and all the string diagram stuff is, is definitely, you should definitely think of it as higher dimensional outgrowths of those ideas. Yeah. Okay, so I think now that we've talked about um, uh, stratifications and string diagram stratifications and full string diagram stratifications, and we've extremely briefly said what we mean by an n category anyway, uh, it's time to finally give our definition of uh, the completion of, uh, of an n category. Okay, well, at least to start giving the definition. So uh, C bar is going to itself be this whole n category. And I'm just going to tell you that what the zero morphisms are at first. And the zero morphisms are exactly the, the, the higher dimensional algebras in C. Okay, so let's get started on this definition. The, an algebra in C, maybe I should have written this here first, it consists of this whole tuple of data. It consists of an A1, an A2, all the way up to an AN. And in fact, these AIs, in particular once I is at least two, each of them consists of many different things. There's, it's not just a single choice. There's a whole family of choices. And then there are some annoying things as well. Um, there, are some, there are some Bs as well that go up to B n minus 1. But we're mostly going to ignore those and skim over some technical details to do with those. Okay. So what are they? So each of, the, each of these AIs is some i-morphism of the original category. So A0 uh, is some zero morphism. And A1 is some one morphism from A0 to A0. And then in general, uh, what, are the, the, what are the AKs? 
Well, if you give me some k-sphere S, and drawn on that k-sphere is some full string diagram, so completely filling out the topology of the sphere, and that full string diagram on the sphere is labelled by the lower dimensional pieces of the algebra, that is, the AJs for, for J less than or equal to K, okay, then the algebra specifies a morphism that lives at the centre of that sphere, something that's shaped like a cone over that sphere. We'll draw some pictures in a moment. Uh, okay. And then there are some Bs, and let's not worry about them for now. And then there's some axioms saying how all these morphisms play with each other, uh, called the egalitarian axiom, which we'll specify in just a moment. Okay. And the claim is that this is going to capture... These, these things here are going to capture item potents in dimension one, algebras in dimension two, and a good notion in all the higher dimensions. Before we go too crazy thinking about higher dimensional stuff, let's just stop and see how this pans out in low dimensions to get our head around the definition. So an algebra in a one category consists of the choice of A0, a zero morphism, and it consists of an A1, which is a morphism from A0 to A0. It also consists of a B1, which we, I skimmed over the definition, but it's going to be a morphism from A0 to A0 as well. And they'll satisfy some conditions, which I'll specify for general N in a second, and then go back to the N equals 1 example so you can see what it says. Okay, but for now, that's an algebra in a 1 category, which we want to be an item per number. An algebra in a 2 category consists of the following. So again, it's an A0 and an A1 from A0 to A0. But then it's this whole family of A2s. Okay. So what are these A2s parameterized by? These A2s are parameterized by take some, uh, some, one, some one sphere and decorate that one sphere with a full stratification. So a full stratification of a one manifold just means finitely many points in the one manifold. And it's full exactly if there's at least one point. Okay? You can't have zero points, so then there'll be a stratum which isn't a disk, but as long as there's one point, you're okay. And then for any configuration like that, uh, we're meant to have an A2, which looks like a cone over, over, over that stratification of the boundary. Okay. So here, um, we've got some sort of valence 1 A2s. In fact, there's two of them. I haven't been talking about it, but there are some orientations that, that you can put. So you can either have an, an A2 with, a, with an outwards going A1 string or an A2 with an inwards coming A1 string. Uh, you can have a, an A2 two points on the boundary, you can even need two or three points on the boundary with whatever orientations you want, and so on. Up. Okay, so there's this whole family of A2s of all, of all different valences, but the valence is at least one. And there are some Bs, which uh, again, we're going to uh, skim over a little bit. And these satisfy some conditions coming from whatever this egalitarian axiom is. Okay. Everyone sort of see what I... I mean so far? Okay. The, the, the general axiom here uh, is, is hopefully not too scary uh, now that you've seen how A2 pans out in dimension 2. It's just, it's just this idea that, that you have a, morphism, a choice of morphism uh, with shape any cone over, over a full diagram on the, on the sphere. And in the two category case, does this correspond to something I already know? Yeah, so these are, remember in a second, these are just going to be Frobenius algebras. So, yeah. Uh, the, uh, no, in the, in the one category case, remember we're looking for an item potent. So A0 is going to be an object of the category, and A1 is going to be an endomorphism of that object, and in a moment the egalitarian principle is going to say basically that A1 squared equals A1. That is, it's, a, it's an endomorphism that squares to itself. Okay? Uh, yeah, B1 is a little weird. Um, it, it, the, these Bs are essential, and none of the proofs later work without putting the bees in at the right places. In dimension one, it turns out the bees are inessential, and you can, you can sort of sweep them under the rug. That is, you can take one of these things with bees and make see that everything's isomorphic something without a bee. So they're kind of inconvenient down at n equals one, but we'll see they, they become necessary later. <coughs> okay. Um, okay, so let's try and say what the, uh, the egalitarian axiom is. I made up this word replete yesterday as just, it's a bad word. It's just meant to be like a full, but, but just some other word because I needed some slight tweak on the idea of full. Okay, so, so say you've got some string diagram and it's entirely labeled by AKs and BKs. That is the, the bits and pieces of one of your higher dimensional algebras. Okay, 
All that we want to say is that if you ignore all the BKs, which we're doing anyway, then it's a full stratification. Then if you want to care about the Bs, it, what it says is that every cell of that full stratification either meets the boundary, and remember, since it was a full stratification, it had to meet the boundary exactly once, or, or if it doesn't meet the boundary, then it better have a, one of these B morphisms sitting inside of it. Okay, who cares? The egalitarian axiom just says that any two, string any two replete string diagrams with the same boundary are just equal. Okay? And that's all, that's all the axioms describing one of these algebras. Let's go back to n equals 1 and n equals 2 and see how, uh, how that pans out. Okay. So uh, let's look at... Well, okay, so here's a, here's a, a string diagram stratification of, uh, of an interval. We've just put a single point labeled by A1 in it. And here's another one. So here I've put an A1, a B1, and an A1. Okay? So th this is satisfying that rule that in order to be replete, any, any interval that's in the interior has to have a B morphism inside of it. Okay. So the axiom says that these two are equal. So equal means they determine the same morphism. Um, well, okay, so this is, the this is the condition. Yeah, so remember when we're defining uh, algebras back here, an algebra consists of this whole huge family of choices, A0, A1, A2, and so on. But those choices have to satisfy a condition. And the condition here is that, um, for in n equals 1, the condition is that uh, your choice of a1 and b1 and a1 has to be such that that morphism evaluates, that string diagram there evaluates to the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah no, that, that's good. And hence, uh, and hence uh, evaluate to the same string diagram. Uh, to the same, no, no, sorry, hence evaluate to the same morphism. Okay. Okay, so in fact, in dimension one, that relation, uh, this equals this, is everything. The, the egalitarian axiom just says that, it doesn't say anything more. Okay, let's look at some examples in n equals two. So here's some diagram um, which uh, is, uh, is replete according to this definition. So it's a, it's, you can see it fills out the topology of the disk. And my only internal cell here has a has a B on it, and so the the egalitarian axiom says, ah, that should just be the same as this guy, the A two that you got just by taking the cone on that on that boundary. Okay, and you can see uh, that uh, this is starting to look a little bit like like the axioms for a, for an algebra, because in particular, uh, I could have done this the other way round. I would have had to put the B in the middle there. Okay. Oops. Both of those guys are equal to this four-valent thing, and you can see that this is saying something about associativity of this three-valent morphism from uh, from A1 tensor A1 to, to A1. Okay. So the, the the usual notion of algebra is starting to appear. Okay, and there's another relation that says that you can remove bubbles as long as those bubbles have B zeros in them. Uh, and in fact, in n equals two, these should be all of the relations that the egalitarian axiom is telling you about. Okay, now what I, I want to do a bit more in these n equals 1 and n equals 2 examples. I want to show you that they really are what you wanted them to be, um, just idempotents and just algebras. But in order to do that, um, I need to say a little bit about the higher morphisms. Because like, obviously here in n equals 1, something has gone wrong. It's not just an idempotent. There's this extra piece of data. There's this B1. Okay, uh, Dave? Should you have something between those two, the two male diagrams of this, this four male? Oh, you're, you're just arguing with this is actually being everything? I was including that as, as, as part of this one. I mean, this is telling you how to take two three-valent things and stick it into a four-valent. You're talking about taking a three-valent thing and a one-valent thing and turning it into a two-valent thing. So, yeah. That, 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 was, yeah. that was meant to be part of the first family. Okay. Okay, so something has obviously gone wrong in n equals 1. We have these stupid B1 morphisms. These things aren't just item potents. There's this extra piece of data around. I want to tell you that actually nothing's gone wrong, and these really are just the same as familiar item potents. But to do that, I need to talk a little bit about higher morphisms. Uh, what time did I start? You start five minutes late. Five minutes late. Okay, so 15. Okay. okay, 
So, okay. So we need to define higher morphisms. Um, okay, here's some gross definition of higher morphisms. Um, the, okay, so what's the, what's the basic idea? So uh, we're going to define some J-morphism in the completion. And because it's some higher morphism, it's got sources and targets, or, or more generally, some, some, some boundary. And so the, the boundary of one of these J-morphisms is going to be described to you by, um, well, this morphism will have some shape, some, some J-ball. Its, it's boundary, uh, boundary X will be some, uh, some J minus one sphere. And it will already have been labeled by smaller morphisms of the completion. Okay, so just think about the very simplest case where we're thinking about M, a one morphism. Okay, that should be some one morphism from some algebra A, which itself consists of A0, A1, A2, and so on, to some other algebra A prime. Okay, that's the sort of thing we're trying to do now. We're trying to define a, a one morphism between two zero morphisms. Okay, so in general, one of these J morphisms consists of a whole bunch of data. And this data is kind of almost the same as the data for an algebra. The axioms look almost the same except it starts in dimension J now, okay? It, it, it starts with a one, if you're looking at a one morphism, it starts with a one morphism in regional category C and then goes all the way up to N. And similarly has these annoying B for bubble factor. Okay. Um, I think, let me not try and unpack this definition too far because we uh, don't need it so much for now. I just want to emphasize that the, the axiom is almost the, the, the description of the J morphisms is almost identical to the descriptions of zero morphisms. But magically, out is going to pop notions of, of uh, intertwiners between idempotents or bimodules between algebras and, and so on. Okay. Because I want to get back to the N equals one example and make sure that I really, I don't run out of time before I've at least said that. Um, so what I wanted to, to, to convince you of is that really this C bar is actually the same as the item burden completion of the one category C, even though it looked a little bit different. Okay, so first of all, let's just see what a one morphism is. So say we've got two zero morphisms in the in C bar, so that, that is an, an A0, an A1, a B1, and an A0 prime, an A1 prime, and a B1 prime, two different algebras. And remember, they both satisfy this axiom that uh, if you look at A1, B1, A1, that's just... A1, okay, well, and the same, the same equation with primes, uh, but awkwardly, it's not just the equation saying A1 squared equals A. Okay, so then if you unpack the definition on the previous slide of what a one morphism between those guys is, it's just this, so it's some M1, a one morphism from A0 to A0 prime, satisfying this relation, that you can either put an A1, B1 on the left, or you can put a B1 prime, A1 prime on the right, and either of those things is just M1. Okay, so... Uh, I'm just going to explicitly write down the functors back and forth from this completion that is a little bit too big to the idempotent completion. So if I have an A0, A1, B1, I can just send that to the pair, the object A0 and the endomorphism A1 composed with B1. Okay? And uh, if I have some morphism between these, these triples here, I can just send it to M1, B1 prime. Okay. So A1, B1 really is an honest idempotent, okay? Because if you just look at this, uh, this equation we wrote up here, and you just wrote an extra B1 on the side that just came along for the ride, that's exactly the idempotent. That's exactly saying A1, B1 is, is an idempotent, okay? So this is ending up in the right place, and you can check that M1, B1 prime really does satisfy the, the, the equations that morphisms in an idempotent completion are meant to be. Okay, what about going back the other way? If we've got some honest idempotent x comma p, we just send it to x comma p comma id. That is, we just let b1 be trivial. Okay. And the claim is that, well, these two functors aren't the inverses of each other on the nose. Uh, one direction uh, is, um, really is the identity on the nose. And the other direction, that is if you start here and go across to here and then come back that way, you've really just got the what you started with because this it went away but if you start in the completion and go down to the item burden completion and then come back again you get something that's that's not quite what you started with but you can write down the following explicit isomorphism between the thing you started with and the thing that that you ended up with 
So even though this is the extra B1 data, it's kind of just a little piece of fluff that, that two things with, the, with different B1s are isomorphic anyway. They're, they're an inconvenient uh, thing when you're trying to specialize to later mechanical cases, but important later on. Okay. Uh, somewhat, uh, with somewhat less detail, uh, here's the, the description of how you go from the the completion of a two category to the algebra is in a two category. So here in a two category, a zero morphism consisted of, of all this data, this A0, this A1, this whole family of A2s for all the different valence cones, and then a B0 and a B1. And then you can produce a, a special Frobenius algebra out of that in the following way. You look at, at the two valent A2, and you stick a B1 near it, and it, you can check that that thing isn't idempotent, uh, and so you can take the image of that idempotent and declare that to be the algebra. You can define the multiplication by taking little trivalent vertices the, with some B1s in the right places and co-multiplication by a different trivalent vertex with the B1 in the right place. And it's pretty easy to check that the axioms for a Frobenius algebra uh, follow from the, um, uh, the axioms for the A's and the, and the bubbles, that is from the, that egalitarian principle. And indeed, you can check that, that this map here really is inducing a, an equivalence of categories, even though it feels like there's some superfluous data here, again, up to equivalences. Uh, that superfluous data turns out to not really matter. Okay, so uh, let's see. Uh, let me just work out which bits I want to tell you in the remaining time. Um, okay, I think I'm going to... Um, yeah, I think I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Maruta equivalence uh, from, uh, from the original category into the completion to give you a, at least to give you a flavor of the sorts of arguments uh, that go on. Uh, you'll, you'll see more in similar vein in, in Kevin's talk. Okay, so. Five minutes. I've got five minutes. Yep. Oh, sorry? Yeah. Oh, is that clock not right? It, it, was, it was until 10 20. Oh, oh, okay, okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I, I, yeah, of course. Not, not okay. Not yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, okay, maybe um, let me. Okay, I'll, I'll give. I'll do it. Okay. okay. Sorry. Uh, okay. So, um, anytime you have a, a k-morphism in the original category, you get a k-morphism in C bar. The basic idea is to just say the level of zero morphisms. If we had our a nor a zero morphism of C, you can just fill in, you can put A naught, and then at all the higher levels, you can just take like, iterated identities over all of the A naughts to fill in all that higher dimensional, that higher dimensional stuff. Okay, so what is a Morita equivalence uh, between N categories? Well, it's meant to be some bimodule category, so some sort of domain wall between them, with a whole lot of isomorphisms that tell you that you can uh, change between D-labeled regions and C-labeled regions. So there's some isomorphism that says any picture like this, where there's a C-string diagram on the outside, a D-string diagram on the inside, and an M-string diagram on the boundary, uh, that can be converted into a purely C-string diagram. Similarly, you, could, you can add one handles of C stuff. If you've got a mixed CD diagram here, there's a bijection between the mixed CD diagrams of that shape and the mixed CD diagrams of that shape. And you have one of these for each, each, each handle that you might want to add to convert between C and D regions. Okay, so in order to provide uh, morphisms like this, uh, in order to give the Morita equivalence, we're going to have to provide a, a bimodule M here, and we'll just take M to be C bar itself, so this is going to be C bar as a C, C bar bimodule. And to do all of these rewritings, what we need to be able to do is take some C bar diagram some string diagram consisting of all these higher algebras and bimodules between them. And you need to be able to convert that back to just a plain C picture. So like here, if we want to remove a one handle of D stuff, we need to be able to convert C bar stuff into C stuff. And the basic idea, say we've got some mixed diagram here. So the purple lines in the green region are, are string diagrams that are already labeled by algebras and bimodules. And the purple stuff outside are just honest morphisms of the category. What you can do is just pick some, some string diagram stratification that's a refinement of the stuff that's already there in the region you wanted to convert to C region, but it's a refinement that's full, okay? 
and then you just label all that stuff with the with the with the these internal morphisms, the, 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 the bits and pieces of the algebra. And that uh, that takes a region labeled by C bar stuff and converts it into a region labeled by C stuff. Oh. Uh, the idea is just you could think of any any region labeled by an algebra is the same thing as that region labeled by a very fine graph actually labeled by the edges and vertices that constitute that algebra. That's that's the only idea going on here. Okay. And so you need to be able to check then that this that this map that rewrites stuff in the completion back in the original category really does give you isomorphisms, so you can sort of you can go back and forth. And uh, yeah, okay. And so there are some there are some uh, there are some ways of doing that, uh, which maybe I will defer. You can either read the slide again in the notes, or talk to me and Kevin about it later if you care about it, or read the paper whenever it finally gets done. Um, but yeah, okay, you've got that. Uh, and then one slide to, oh, oh okay, okay. Um, there's this claim that that inclusion is terminal. That is, it's the best possible uh, inclusion of C into something that induces a Merida equivalence. So what if you had something else, an epsilon taking you from C into D that gave a Merida equivalence? We meant to see that D sits inside C bar. And you can, you can see some pretty, some nice ideas in here. How do we construct this phi from D up into C bar? Let's just indicate how you do it at the level of zero morphisms. So given a zero morphism of D, we're meant to produce an honest algebra in, in C bar. So what do you do? Well, you take a little disk labeled by X naught, that zero morphism. So actually it's like the, the n-fold identity on the zero morphism. And you use the fact that you've got this Merida equivalence that lets you take little bits of D region and write them back into C. That's exactly what a Merida equivalence is. So you punch out a little hole in the middle of X naught, and that's some C region, so it must be some zero morphism of C naught that you see inside there. And you declare that to be your A1. A different thing you could do is punch out two little holes using the Merida equivalence, and then punch out the one handle in between them. Okay, so when you punch out the two little holes, we know already that you've got A naught. And then when you punch out the one handle between them, you must get some C, C diagram in here, so it's going to be some A1 from that A0 to that A0. And we'll use that as our A1 of the algebra associated to X. And similarly, you could punch out three little regions, and then punch out the one handles connecting them, and then finally punch out the disk in the middle, Okay, and that would have to produce some morphism in C after you've done all that punching, and you declare that to be your your A two. Now, the the handle cancellation laws for Merida equivalences, saying it doesn't matter what order you punch out handles in, uh, exactly turns into the egalitarian axiom for, for for this data. Okay, and that's why this sort of procedure really is letting you construct a morphism from some arbitrary thing Merida equivalent to C. Uh, into the into this canonical uh, completion of, of C, which it's still more to equivalent to. Okay, I really better stop. I've gone over time. I'm very sorry. Any questions? Yeah, man. That was a very clear talk. I have some psychological dissonance about that. Uh, what's the relationship between all these axioms which don't have summations and coefficients in them, uh, like associativity for trivalent vertices, and things like the F move that I'm also familiar with, where they're or, or moving a loop? Yeah, this is this is a great question and gives me the opportunity to go to the next slide, <laughs> <laughs> um, where uh, I just I, I want to kind of briefly indicate. So three-dimensional algebras, we never got to dimension three in this talk, but three-dimensional algebras in VEC, it turns out are just fusion categories, even though there's no summations anywhere. Uh, and so this slide tells you how to do that, okay? So um, uh, I think I've mislabeled, every have I mislabeled everything? Oh no, yeah, okay, okay. So A0, there's just no choice. Uh, A1, it turns out the right thing to do is to take functions on the irreducible objects in your fusion category. And then the A2 edge, so the, the, that is the, the seams in these three-dimensional soap bubbles that are going to be de describing this three-algebra corresponding diffusion category, is just going to be the direct sum over x, y, and z all simples of, uh, of homs from 1 to x tensor, y tensor, z. And then there's this A3, which is this soap bubble guy that, that, that looks like associativity, 
Yeah, it's like the, the, the cone over a tetrahedron. And that single solitary thing is the entire associator all packaged together. It's the way of taking, oh, so, so here, here there really should be uh, some direct sums uh, or, your, or your objection uh, uh, gets us in trouble. Um, and so, yeah, so that A3 is just the whole collection of associators telling you how to, how to take two of these seams uh, there and there and repackage them into, into two seams with the, the boundary sheets arranged in some different way. Uh, uh, there are some hints about what to do with the, these bubble factors B, and you finally see them becoming important and interesting. Um, and then sort of examples of this egalitarian principle. So here are meant to be two different pictures of a three-dimensional soap bubble. So you've got to imagine little, little sheets in between all these, these guys here. So here, this is like a, a cylinder with a disc in the middle, and some, maybe some fins coming off it. Um, those are two full string diagrams. So the egalitarian principle says they're exactly equal. Uh, but you can see that this one is something involving two associators, and this one is something involving three associators. You can unravel everything, and that's exactly the Pentagon equation. That is the, the, the F move uh, for, the, for the fusion category you got, you got things from. Uh, and, uh, Will there be summations in that one? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, here this formula has no summations, but because each of these associators is is some big matrix of maps, when you actually multiply everything out here, the, the summations turn up, uh, basically because we're composing because these diagrams turn into compositions of matrices, so the summations turn up uh, in the compositions too. But yeah, it is. But I think it is kind of nice that somehow the the axioms for a fusion category here have sort of been reformulated into something that's got no labels and no summations at all. It's really just the 2, 3, Parkner move uh, is all you need to write down to capture, to capture the, the, the Pentagon equation. Any other questions? Not less than Scott again.